Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we are joined back on for part two of the drums of Nico McBrain with Shane Kinney of the Drum Center of Portsmouth. Shane, welcome to the podcast. Thank you again for having me, Bart. Yes, it is an honor. Um, I love part twos of these because we get to kind of look back and go like, oh, uh, people actually are listening. <laughs> they are enjoying this. Um, yeah. And they really are. I think part one, at the, a week in, it's got something like 6,000 views on YouTube and a lot oh, of right. downloads on the podcast uh, you know, platforms. So people are really enjoying it. Um, oh, that's wonderful. If you haven't checked out part one, you probably want to do that before watching this, but you don't have yeah. to. Today, we're going to be kind of picking it up when um, when he switches from sonar. I feel like I say things wrong. Sure, it's sonar more. Or s- I feel like I'm saying it very American, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's all right. How do you pronounce it? Well, th- I, I say sonar. So, but it's really sonor. Sonor, okay. And and but that doesn't roll off of my tongue no. very well. So I say sonor. No. And and someone commented saying, I can't wait to hear the American pronunciations of what I say premiere. Oh, but I guess premier. It's premier. <laughs> yeah, so there we go. Premier. Yeah, um, we're gonna do this the ex colonial way. Yeah. It's premier. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. um anyway, Shane, before we hop in, I know you have a couple things you want to address from part one. So why don't we do that now and then we'll yes. uh, we'll, oh, we'll move on. Yeah, thank you. So I, I knew I would make a couple of mistakes. Uh and and so you know, this what the best part of having part two is that it gives me an opportunity to correct myself. Um and uh, I think the first most important thing was I had pointed out that choral snare drum that uh, was used in uh, the videos, um, the Aces High and the Two Minutes Midnight video, I believe. Uh, yeah. It was a pearl snare drum. And I had mentioned that it was a gift from Tico Torres. It was actually a gift from Frankie Benali. So oh, okay. that was that was an error. Um, another one, too, was the uh, – I mentioned on the Live After Death album that those were the final four nights of the – tour that was also incorrect somebody corrected me on that one in the comments okay. and i went and looked at it and i was like oh duh. and i don't yeah I don't, whatever I don't yeah it's yeah. all good and then there was a, another thing you had asked about gross and you know gross impressions and was he the main guy and i i sort of concluded that he was and in retrospect looking back right after i said that i remember thinking well steve smith uh, you know was kind of a huge thing for sonar but he did leave journey in the early 80s but if we're talking gross impressions the journey videos probably gave sonar the most gross impressions yeah and as well as simon wright with acdc and the you shoot me all night long video but yeah, yeah. again that was a one and done kind of thing for simon wright and, and, and uh phil rudd was long out of the picture so if we're talking about consistency you know, from the beginning to the end of the decade, I think Nico really was their their highest profile guy. Yeah, which I think that goes a long way of the consistent, oh, this guy loves this brand. We see Sonar yeah. all the time on his kick drum and he's proud mm-hmm. of it. Um, I, I don't know if this is verified, but I remember someone also made a comment that said that that, that final the last straw of the A&R thing, someone said it wasn't a it, it, it was a kit. This is again just a comment. They said it was a mm-hmm. kit borrowed from like a fan. Yeah, that, where he yeah, threw I read the floor that. Tom. I don't know if that's verified, but yeah, that's it. That's an interesting point. That, that it's if it, possible. It, possible where he didn't yeah. realize when he chucked the floor tom that it actually belonged yeah. to someone. Yeah, just, and I could see that scenario playing out too, where the distributor frantically calls to the music stores and says, "Do you have a customer that bought any of these kits, and we need this really quick?" And that's could be what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it was in New Zealand, right? Yeah. Yeah. So not the biggest market for massive, you know, no, no. giant concert, Tom sonar kits, but, um, no. um, okay. So does that bring us up to, it does. Okay. There is a mystery kit, um, uh, that is, uh, worth mentioning. Okay. Uh, uh, he had told me that you know, when he went right before he went to premiere, right, right after the New Zealand incident, uh, they had about eight or nine more dates on that tour. And then there was going to be a break. And then they were going to do another small, short tour that was going to be Bruce Dickinson's farewell. Hmm. And that was going to be in the UK. And that was his plan was to move to a new kit for that tour, which ultimately became the premiere drums. 
And Sonar actually made him a kit for that tour. And he seems to remember it being a Sonar light kit, which was uh, a Burt shell. And he said it was black with the white gaskets, which leads me to believe it was the Sonar light and not the highlight because the highlight didn't have those gaskets. Hmm. So he said he sent the kit back. He didn't, he said he didn't remember if he played any dates on it. And I found YouTube bootleg videos of the rest of that tour. And there is no, I, I don't see that kit. So I think it's very likely that it never saw the light of day. He said it sent, he sent it back to Sonar. And so there is very likely somebody out there that has a kit in those sizes that actually went to Nico. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So if that person is listening, you know, that he should get a hold of you because that would be cool. Yeah, yeah, really. But that was that was like after the relationship was pretty much ended, right? And he was kind of done with it. And Well, there's a chance that the kit was delivered to the Iron Maiden warehouse prior to the New Zealand wear event, oh, you know? So I see, yeah. And so when they were doing their stock take prior to the tour, they went to get everything together and and uh yeah, that was probably yeah. Yeah. Got so, it. Tough to say. It's uh but anyway, that tour ended in the fall. Uh, the, the the tour, the New Zealand incident happened in the fall, and then uh, the next tour started in March. And so that was his opportunity to move to Premier and get those drums ready for that next tour. Got it. Okay. And that brings us to where we are. Yeah. So that brings us to kit number one, uh, which is the black uh, Premier Signia. This is a big change uh, for him because these are maple shells. Uh, with reinforcement rings. And so he had been using thicker shells uh, with a, a straight wall shell, sharper edge. And now these are maple shells with bee tree rings, very different sounding drums. Hmm. Um, and he's also now over to the DW pedals. He's over to the Vic Firth sticks. Uh, and he's using the Premier heads. So we're talking big changes. <laughs> like this is, yeah, this is a big, big change. Uh, um, for him. And, and so at the time, Premier had just bought themselves back from Yamaha. Yamaha had owned Premier from about 87 to 92, I think. They basically saved the company. Uh, with, uh, and then they couldn't save them from themselves, though, because they bought themselves back from Yamaha and, you know, struggled uh, after that, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Premier to me is the greatest tragedy for a drum brand in, in, in our industry. Hmm. Premier and George Way are like the two, yeah. I mean, George Way on a much smaller scale, but Premier, I mean, we're talking, you know, so many patents and innovations and yeah. quality. And it's just a shame that uh, what, what's happened to them. But anyway, uh, he was really uh, uh, keen to move over to Premier uh, from what I gather. And uh, this kit was gorgeous but premier's hardware wasn't to his muster and i think when you're playing sonar hardware for as long as he did it's very difficult to fall in love with another company's hardware because sonar's hardware at the time was so great so yeah yeah, yeah. they were known for their chrome finishing it, at that point though yeah or, or forever because there was the stories of it was the same chrome factory or plant that did the rolls royce parts which i don't yes. know if that's true at all yes. but yep. um yeah but the hardware was not up to his up to snuff right so yamaha when, when yamaha took over uh with premier that that was a great opportunity for both brands because premier was very much struggling at the time yamaha yamaha came in the, yamaha really wanted to get uh more exposure in the european market and so it gave them an opportunity to modernize the premier factory and the, the Premier Factory was able to make Premier drums and Yamaha drums for the European market. Really a win-win situation. And when the partnership ended, Yamaha gave them all, left all of that equipment, uh, all the molds, all the wow. dies, um, and it gave them an opportunity to really uh, excel. But the hardware molds were all very Yamaha-esque. And at that time, and really still to this day, Yamaha's not big on memory locks. They don't... Um, you know, they, they leave that up to you. Uh, if you if you want to if you want a memory lock, then you know, put a piece of hose clamp or something yeah, on there. Add it. And so Nico really, with again the tight tolerances that he has, he really needs stands that have that type of technology on there. Um, and so that those stands just were they they didn't work for him. Hmm. 
Um, and, and so the Premier hardware was basically a clone of the Yamaha hardware. It was very, very similar because obviously Same. the molds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he, he decided to go to a rack system. And Tom Falicon, uh, who's down based in Clearwater, Florida at the time, uh, designed this rack system that, that he used. And this, this system he used for uh, over 10 years, I think. Really? It just right, yeah, it was right over, it was until I think 2004. That, so you know, maybe 10, 12 years that he used it. So on every wow. kit moving forward until, um, until the white uh, Ed kit. Well, it's, uh, it, it's, it's cool rack. and it maintains that kind of like, like we talked about that very tight around him mm-hmm. where a lot of racks are flat on the front and then kind of bend around. But this kind of comes to a point in the middle right. uh, to explain for, you know, again, our audio folks of like, uh, it's a very, and then it comes down almost to like a V at the bottom uh, yeah. as opposed to just straight. I mean, he's, he's, he's really has a nice tight footprint on his kit here. I think it looks cool. I, 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 I really always liked it. And he told me that he preferred stands. He just absolutely prefers stands. He just didn't care for uh, the Premier's hardware at the time. And so, but what is really, there's there's a couple of cool things about this kit is that the Signia mount, uh, you know, a, as you can see, um, the Signias have the long tube lug. Yeah. And the mounts... Uh, actually grab the lugs and you can, they move up and down on the drum. And so what he did is he moved those mounts to the other side of the drum. So when you look at those toms, it looks like they're actually floating. It does. I was wondering, I was, yeah, yeah. I was trying to figure that out, but interesting. Yeah. Cause he has the mounts positioned lower uh, on the opposite side of the drum. So it's facing him. And so it gives you that impression that you have these truly flying toms, but I just, I thought it made it for a cool look. And I've totally. seen some pictures of him like experimenting uh, both ways, but you know, i the most interesting picture I think I found of this kit was, um, here. This is a very horrible picture. <laughs> uh, but you know, in researching for all this, I was going through bootleg videos on YouTube. And I was checking to see, you know, when like the first date of this tour looked like. And, and there are videos of the first few dates. And on the first few dates of the tour with his new kit, he's using that rack system. But this clip is in Vienna. And if you could see by the picture, there's no rack system. Yeah. So I don't know what happened here, but something happened. Mm. And they had to plan for this. Because we're talking, they, they had night, they were playing night after night after night after night. And in the very first week, he's not using the rack system for this one gig. My only assumption is that it was a loading issue where they couldn't, you know, because the rack is pretty heavy uh, uh, and, and sizable. Maybe they couldn't get it in the venue the way he needed to. Maybe it was a stage matter. But there was some sort of issue there. Yeah, yeah. But looking at that, Compared to like the the you know the one from the ad the Nico McBrain on the bottom Premier Percussion mm-hmm. so much cleaner to not have all those yeah. stands it just looks it looks very sharp it does yeah. and, and this picture that I'm posting is just merely an incident because I saw dates after that and the rack was back so okay. I don't know what happened but mm-hmm. they clearly had the stands yeah whether. So th- Oh, they're what, ready for an accident or something. Or, or that they have to go buy them. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Something happened. And yeah. uh, I, I just recently found that. So I was I, I brought that up because I think it's just a cool little yeah, uh, nugget very cool. for information. Size-wise on these drums, um, it's the same you know formula that he'd been using with throughout the other kits, except that the six-inch tom is actually square. It's a six-by-six, six, not a six-by-eight. Uh, we have 8 by 8, 10 by 10, 12 by 12, 13 by 13, 14 by 14, 15 by 15, 16 by 16 rack toms, 24 by 18 bass drum, and then an 18 by 16 inch deep floor tom because that's what they uh, offered at the time. Hmm. Now, in their catalog, the Signia is listed as being offered in a 14 by 5.5 and, and a 14 by 7 depth. When I ran that by, it, it, I've seen things that, that, that indicated he was using a 14 by seven at the time. And he very confidently said that 
he never used the 14 by seven. So there is a chance that it was cut to size for him, you know, uh, that it was a 14 by six and a half cut, especially for him. Hmm. Uh, my guess is it's probably a five and a half. And whoever printed that it was a 14 by seven just got that wrong. Yeah. That's uh, it's tough to say. Easy mistake. When I look at this picture here, it does look like it could be a little deeper than a five and a half. It's possible, but I can't see it close enough to really, really tell. Yeah. So it's, it's likely they cut made a six and a half specifically for it. It's not like they could sure. do that. Yeah. 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 Peisty symbols still. Still on Peisty symbols, but uh, we're on the signature series, uh, and and this is pretty static for a little while. He's using the signature power crashes, sound edge hats. Of course, he's going to have uh, one rude somewhere, although it's not listed on this setup. I'm not sure. He, he had mentioned he always had at least one rude on his kit. Okay. Uh, but he's got the heavy belt, uh, and he's got using the premier Rod Morgenstein heads. So the only thing that stays the same here for him is is Peisty symbols. We have new drums, we have new heads, we have new bass drum pedal, new sticks. New sticks. We're on Vic Firth at this point. Um, so yeah, that's like a, a big, big, big change for him. Hmm. Good for Peisty. They made the yeah. cut. They made yeah. the cut. But um, yeah, man, he must have just like what year was this? Remind me. Is 92. This? Okay. 92, so, 93. Okay. So it's not like it's 90 new decade. I mean, he's been doing it right. for a couple of years, but that's, yeah. that's great. Try to shake things up. But mostly it was circumstantial. I mean, it, it wasn't right. like he left because, you know, for, for stupid reasons, obviously we went through why he, the sonar thing ended. Yeah. Um, and he went to the premier heads because he went to premier drums yeah. and premier offered heads. So, uh, and then Shaw Sticks, they went, they went, went out of business, so he needed a new stick company. And Ludwig, um, uh, Bill Ludwig had let had left the company at that point, and and Bill was Nico's point of contact there, so he had no reason to stay with the Speed King pedal. Um, so at that point, he was willing to try a new pedal, and DW was really the hot new ticket, and so yep. he went to that. Uh, not as an endorser again; he was buying those pedals. Uh, and and so, but he was using a Premier hat stand at this point. So okay, not okay. the not the DW guy hat stand. Yeah, yeah, or the sonar that he used for a long time. Right, as a, as right. a, a, a staple. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. There wasn't a sonar or anything on his kit. Until <laughs> He's like <laughs> twenty fifteen. We're done. So. We're done. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, that so, is a beautiful kit. Beautiful yeah. finish. Um, yeah, he switched into black because he was using white or a variation of it for a long time. Well, I guess yeah. he, had the, he had the high tech kit, which was darker, but um, but he had three white kits in a row. True, you know. So this is a new, you know, th- th- this was, you know, that was the white period, and now this was the dark period. And he's going through the black because, yeah, he was going through a lot of changes with his drums, but the band was going through a lot of changes too because their singer was about to depart. So. Um, there was just, uh, you know, a lot of changes going on. I, yeah. I, I couldn't imagine what was going through all their heads at that point. But brief uh, yeah. maiden history that I, I mean, I was three years old at that point. Mm. Did Bruce leave? Yeah. He yeah. This did. is the fine. This tour was basically, uh, a, a farewell tour. They knew he was leaving. And, and so okay. I don't they think wanted I to do a couple of live, they wanted to do a live album of some of the newer material and some of the old, older material, you know, uh, while Bruce was still there. Gotcha. Okay. And that's what that purpose of this tour was. Okay. So yeah, that was like, uh, yeah, Bruce was gone from, for six years. So this is right where, before we enter a, a pretty dormant period, which is, you know, they didn't put out another album until 95, uh, which is three years or so. Wow. Uh, and, and so that's when their, their new singer blaze came in, blaze Bailey came in. This week's episode is brought to you by GM Designs Custom Symbols, where tradition meets innovation. At GM Designs, they craft symbols that push the boundaries of what's possible. From irregular shapes and unique hammering to odd sizes, the thinnest symbols, and the largest bells, they're creating sounds you won't find anywhere else. Whether you're a pro, studio musician, or passionate beginner, GM Designs Symbols are crafted to inspire your creativity. Break free from the ordinary and embrace the extraordinary with GM Designs. Explore their collection at gmdsymbols.com, rent select products on symbolswap.com, and experience their symbols in person at PASIC 2024. GM Designs, crafted for those who dare to play differently.
And that's when it brings us to our next gift, uh, which is the white signia. Same rack, right? Looking at these yeah, pictures. Yeah, we're on the same rack. Okay. And so what I said before about the Pisces signatures remaining pretty static, I was completely wrong because we went to 2002s on this kit. Oh, okay. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, the white signia kit, which is basically the same shells, the, the, the same everything as we see it, uh, except there's clearly a five and a half by 14 snare there. That is definitely a five and a half. Yeah. Um, but he's using uh, the six, the, the same tom sizes, although on this tour, uh, the, the six and the eight, I'm told from what I gather, were pulled off of the kit. And I think they're not even on the kit in this picture. They were pulled off for a number of the dates. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure why that was. Um, I can, you know, I, I know that here in America, they were playing smaller venues. Um, it was probably a cost cutting measure. Um, or space matter for all we know, or maybe he had an injury or something at the time, but yeah. um, it was definitely a, a, a changing world for the band uh, at that point. So he, 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 the six and the eight were left off for a while. And here's a picture that I was, I found off of a bootleg and you can see that they are not there. Uh, but one thing I do, I, I, I am trying to picture on this is, uh, if he's still using the Morgenstein heads, and it looks like he is. Were those pretty popular say. heads? I know like yeah. Ludwig's were famous for being great, but they went away. But like, were those right. quality, nice? I mean, of course they were if you played them, but. Yes, they were. Well, those were, they, they were really good sounding heads because Rod wanted something that was in between an ambassador and an emperor which is essentially what we know now as the Ambassador X. He wanted a thicker single ply. Yeah. And Premier was using their head to manufacturing method. It was a lot like Ludwig. It was a crimped head. Sounded really good. They weren't incredibly durable. They didn't hold their tune well. Uh, but when they were in tune, they sounded great. But if you look at this picture that I have here, mm -hmm. he's got Remo Starfire Ebony. Not Starfire, I'm sorry. He's got Remo ebony ambassadors on the bottom. So he, he probably used those Morgensteins for the first kit and then went to the Remos. And, and that's why Go when ahead. I look at the, this picture again, uh, you know, I don't see the premier logo anywhere, but I'm, I'm, it's, it's probably Remo at this point. Yeah. Um, it's trusted that you can get them everywhere. I'm sure distribution, getting them in different countries and stuff. That's mm -hmm. maybe a factor too of the ease of, yeah. um, not running into the same New Zealand issue again. Or, <laughs> yeah, know. right. Yeah. Yeah, I always wonder how many heads a, a drummers uh, like uh, on this scale are actually traveling with. Like how many how many snare heads are, are in the trailer? It, it, you yeah, know, is you, it one for every show? Is yeah, it right. two for every yeah. show? That's that's above my... I've watched... There's some cool YouTube videos that are like a yeah. day in the life of a drum tech and they yeah. change them frequently, but... I know some drummers like the worn in sound of a head mm -hmm. that's been used more than one time for two hours or whatever. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, in, in this, the case of Nico, they, they swap the Tom heads out every couple, two or three gigs. And I think the snare every gig. Okay. But the question is, do they actually travel with all the heads for the whole date or do they have them shipped? Because I, I have, have, I yeah. have some professional uh, acts that don't do endorsements and they message me like once a month and they're like, okay, can you deliver this to Minneapolis and put it under this name at the hotel? So interesting. Yeah. It, it just depends on what, you know, they're, they're, they're traveling. Really. Huh. Very cool. Yeah. But this is the kit that we hear. This is the kit that we think that we're hearing on, uh, the X factor, but it was actually the black set that we're hearing on the X factor. So we didn't talk, which was uh, the first album of Blades. We talked about um, that black set, but we didn't mention what it was used on. It was, that was used on, on the X. -Men. Okay, gotcha. And it was also used on Brave New World, uh, okay. which was their first album back with Bruce. So this white one, he, he had a thing for the, that black kid, I guess. He, he liked that one. Yeah. So he used that for Brave New World. But yeah, we're going to 2002s. 14 is 2002 Sound Edge. 2002, 16 inch and 17 inch, 18, 19, 20 power crashes. And he's got a 17, 2002 medium, 17 root crash ride. 
and the 20 inch Novo China, the 22 inch Power Bell Ride, and 22 and 24 inch Chinas. It's a lot of symbols. It's a lot of symbols. Yeah. A lot of Chinas. Yeah. A lot of Chinas. But yeah. I love a good China. Oh, yeah. And the Peisty Chinas are amazing. Oh, they're great. I, I love China symbols. They've kind of fallen out of favor. I mean, people still buy them, but they're not as popular as the trash symbols. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a China guy. I, I love the style of China symbols. That's interesting. That's a good point that the effects trash and the and the stacks and all that have kind of taken the place of oh, chinas yeah. but absolutely no i love chinas i used yeah. i used to love i had an uh, 18 inch a custom china that yeah. for whatever reason that particular one was just my yeah. absolute favorite for a long time until i cracked it of course but um yeah. amazing i love finding it because it's like a good bad sound <laughs> yes <know>? yeah <laughs> yeah i used to use a zildjian k china oh, for yeah. years that i loved and yeah yeah i just love the sound of them it's, it's an exotic sound but to me it's an exclamation point yeah. That's what a China is. And if you, you've got a sea of commas in your crashes, but if you want an exclamation point, yeah. that's the, the China is. Yeah. And very historical with, I mean, yeah. the China goes back thousands of years sure. to the, you know, uh, Janissary bands and obviously back to China um, yes. by, by the name, but, um, probably a dumb question, but maybe worth saying with the, mm. the premieres, Signia would be their top of the line mm -hmm. kit obviously right because he's yeah. he's he's using their flagship best of the best yeah um it's it's interesting too that the sig the the front bass drum head is saying signia yes in so big letters. they were trying to uh now again i don't think i don't know, know this is fact uh, but they were i think premiere was trying to assert themselves as a very high-end brand when they brought themselves back and they thought that by not using the premier name, this would actually help them. And Tom wound up copying them a few years later. And when they released the Star Classic, yeah, they were it was called a division of Tom. Ah, uh. like it was. They were just trying. Things were changing so much in the drum world at that time. DW had come and and shaken everything up. Yeah, really. I mean, Yamaha had really just. Uh, shaped the eighties for drums with recording for custom. Sure. And, and then, and Tama obviously was also oh, Tama and Pearl, big, big players there. Uh, but when DW sort of just came around with this custom shop mentality, maple drums, not birch drums, everything was different. Yeah. And so all the feedback these companies were getting from dealers were you need maple drums and you need custom finishes and, so the whole model needed to change and that can't happen overnight. Yeah. No, so, but that makes sense. Like, Hey, yeah. these are signias. Yes. As yeah. opposed to premier that old, the old brand, you know, right. like this is new. Um, yeah. But even the fact that it's not a big iron maiden logo on the bass drum is interesting, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I, I'm not sure if he actually ever had graphic, a graphic head on there. Somebody I'm sure in the comments will know yeah. on that one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But the other thing about this though, is that the, the badge on those drums, which you can't see, but the badges on Signia's always had a big P on it. So it was sort of a half-hearted attempt to <laughs> separate, you know, separate themselves from that Premier, Premier logo, which I love the Premier logo. And I actually love, love all, all iterations of it. I love yes. the, the, the 70s, the 80s, and 90s. I love that logo. So. I think it's classy yeah. and classic. And mm -hmm. maybe I feel like in America, we think of British things as being very like... I don't know. There's a certain connotation of like, it's very high end and classy, but mm -hmm. like Premier, I, I totally love that. But yeah. again, they're trying to, now we can look back and say, you know, oh, they're an iconic brand, but then they're probably, they're struggling to, you know, yeah. find their footing. Right. Well, yeah. I think um, elegance and refined is a great way to put yes. a lot of the British, yes. uh, the British uh, ethos, because yes. it really with their Premier, all of their, uh, drums and stands over the years. It just it was always a little bit different, and I totally. always just I love that. I love the brand. I just thought they they had such cool stuff. So yep, absolutely, uh, he's using the the DW pedal. DW uh, the Premier hi hat stand for what we know, and we're still with Vic Firth sticks at this time. Okay, and uh, and that's that's that kit. Yes. And this kit is, unfortunately, I do not have a lot of pictures of this kit. This is the Signia Marquee set. So this is for the uh, Virtual 11 tour uh, that uh, was their second and final tour 
uh, with Blaze. Okay. Uh, and this was a this is the, the Signia Marquee is actually a also a maple shell, but straight wall, six ply maple, no reinforcement rings, and they also had die cast tubes. The question is, uh, it, Nico does not like die cast tubes. He likes flange tubes. Uh, when I look at these pictures, it, this looks like a flange tube here. And there's another picture that uh, I have that I'm trying to tell. <laughs> this is a very grainy picture. These look like flange tubes. So I'm not sure if he went to flange tubes right out of the gate or if he was actually using cast tubes at first. I'm willing to bet that he went right out of the gate for flange tubes uh, yeah. on these drums. Yeah. And the six and eight inch toms are back. They're back. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think he probably said, hey, I want that. <laughs> uh, I have uh, listed that he was using a DW hi-hat stand at this point. Again, I don't have any photos to support that. Yep. But that's what it seems like. And obviously, we're still with Dick Firth, and he's using the same cymbal set as he was uh, on the previous setup. Not endorsed by DW yet, though, Not yet. because that didn't happen until the 2000s. Right, right. Okay, so yeah. he's just, which is curious. It's like, hey, Nico, I think you could probably get endorsed by DW at that yeah. point. Yeah, <laughs> you know? but at that point, he's not buying the pedals. The band's going to be buying the pedals. Well, sure. And okay. so when you're entering an endorsement, it's a commitment. Yeah, and that's true. It, and I think that, you know, it's really a matter of, uh, do I want to get involved with this? And I know a lot of drummers that, like, like we're talking, I, I'm not going to mention names, uh, but like drummers that have very high profile endorsements that order from us all the time. And sometimes they order things from companies they're endorsed by. Oh, wow. Yeah. Just to, just to get it and just be, just to get it. That. And, and I think they like it. I know in some cases they just like supporting drum shops. They That's like awesome. buying from music stores. It's, you know, they like that experience. And, and, and so, uh, you know, that may have been the case there. may, may not have been. I, I get that. You forget yeah. sometimes that like these me any mega drummer is still a drummer. Still That's enjoys right. geeking out about gear. That's and right. uh That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And then uh, we've got uh there's a kit that they used for the first Bruce uh reunion. Um that is we're gonna call this one a bonus kit because okay. it's basically a combo of his black and white kit. And there's no really good pictures of it. I've got a screenshot here. You can see he's got a black tom, a white tom, white bass drum. So those are basically the same two kits he already had. He put them together. Alternating uh, black yes. and white, black and white, black and white. Yeah. Yeah. And and so I think this is really the 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 one tour where there wasn't a new kit for that tour. Bruce had just come back uh, and they were playing smaller venues. I know that they weren't sure if this this reformation of the band was going to actually work or not. Hmm. So perhaps they were kind of trying to keep their expenses down. Not sure why why he went this route, but yeah. What are your uh, thoughts I, I on it? it. Do, you, do you like it? I love it because cool. I love the contrast of black and white. I love yeah. the duality. Yeah. Uh, I, when I think of that color, I think of the, the Lars Ulrich white drum set with black hardware. Yep. I, I love that kit. I remember being in Maryland in the early nineties and seeing a concert that I had a white DW kit with black hardware and I've just always been drawn to white drums. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I think I like, I like that. I'm a big Michael Schenker fan and his guitar is black and white. So yeah. Yeah. I'm very a fan. Cool. Yeah. And it looks like we have the premier, uh, I'm fighting very hard to say premier now, uh, not premier, <laughs> premier logo on back on the bass drum yeah. with the maiden font. Yes. Which is awesome. I think it looks great. <laughs> I, I think it just looks awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I love the way the rack looks and I love, you see how, uh, how the gong, uh, is, is mounted in the back. Like, I'm not sure what's going on there with the, like the drapes of, of Chrome. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I like racks too. A rack screams to me like, I'm in a big band and I'm not going to carry this thing around. Yeah. Someone that's else right. is going to break that's this right. down for me. Yeah. <laughs> So another really funny thing about this kit, a fun uh, little fact. So when they reformed, uh, I've seen every tour. I missed one tour, but except I did not see this tour. Hmm. And you know why? I didn't know about it. Uh -huh. 
because I don't think I even had an email address at the time. I, I it was 1999. Oh wow! And and so I don't. I mean, I was. I, I don't think I have an. I, I think I had an email address. I think I had. A, I was my roommate had a computer at the time, but yeah, you know, this information wasn't as available back. Oh then. no, it was no. not easy to find out. And somebody told me in a bar, I remember, because I spent a lot of time in a bar uh, around that time. <laughs> sure. Um, and I had a friend who said, Iron Maiden's back together, and they're and they're going to be coming out with a new album. They're going to be playing. I'm like, Are you kidding? I was so excited. <laughs> That's awesome. And I missed it. The, I missed the show. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was a different time then, obviously. Different I mean, there time. was brought, you know, dial-up internet and stuff like yeah. that. And, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Really funny. Pretty cool. But that brings us to the uh, next kit, which is the uh, Brave New World set, uh, or as we know it, uh, it is the uh, Rock and Rio set, which is the blue yep. premiere kit. Let me uh, get some bigger pictures of this. It's a beautiful finish on this one. This is uh, I love this finish. So this is the the Signy Marquee kit. It's blue uh, with uh, the flanged hoops. And so this is the, like, we know a lot of us know this kit from the Rock and Rio video, uh, the Rock and Rio DVD, which is absolutely fantastic. And if you're a new Iron Maiden fan, I, I, this is the one DVD I would suggest you check out is, is Rock and Rio, because mm. this is a band that is really just firing on all levels. And Nico sounds fantastic. Cool. And these drums sound fantastic. The one thing that we didn't mention about the Black's drums is, you know, he used that on Brave New World, which, going back a little bit, when he went to premiere in the first place, you know, they had a new producer, too. Martin Birch had retired after Fear of the Dark. Uh, and so not only when he had new drums, he also had a new producer. So that was a very different sound. Big for change. Yeah. Big, big change. And when they came to the Brave New World album and he used the black kit on that, they started, they moved, they had part of, part of the agreement when Bruce and Adrian came back to the band was that they recorded in an actual studio and not in Steve's studio, which was on his property. So they agreed to do that and they hired Kevin Shirley. And a lot of people know who Kevin is. He does, he did Celebration Day for Zeppelin, he's done oh, cool. Aerosmith, Dream Theater. Wow. Joe Bonamassa. Kevin it, it, Kevin did my favorite Neil Peart drum sound, which was on the Counterparts album. Um, Kevin is a tone fanatic, and he yeah. understands sonics, I think, better than anybody. I really, I just think he, he was the best thing to ever happen to Nico McBrain's drum sound, bar none. And then, That's that awesome. Brave New High World praise. album. Yeah, bright, the Brave New World album is testimony to that when you listen to the, that drum sound, because the bass drum is right in the front. And uh, granted, we're talking about more technology being used at this point because Martin Birch was still, that was the analog days. The bass drum was always a little bit quiet. And now, Nick, uh, you know, Kevin was able to bring this bass drum to the forefront. And if there's anything Nico is known for, it's his bass drum foot. So, for sure. yeah, this was a really great, great uh, delight to us drummers because we were really able to hear him. Uh, clearly, and and Kevin also embraced overhead mics. So when I see this kit, all I can think of is just this beautiful lush drum sound. So That's awesome. It's a great yeah. it's a great memory for me because it was just an exciting time to have that album uh, and, and and have uh, this great this great sounding drum set. Um, and unfortunately, we do not have uh, a lot of great photos of the kit. We do have this big picture of. Uh, his head here, but we've got, <laughs> you know, you can see he's got flanged hoops over yeah. on the, 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 the toms and he's using a black gong with that Peisty logo. Can you maybe just because we're talking flanged and die cast and the preferences mm -hmm. in your experience, can you maybe explain a little bit about the sonic difference? Yeah, sure. Of why someone would choose flanged versus die cast? Yeah. A die cast hoop is actually cast from an alloy and it's a heavier weighs a lot more than a, a triple flange tube. If you hold a die cast soup in your hand and you hit it, it's going to ring like a bell. Mm -hmm. uh, bing, you know, it's, it's, it's it has a harmonic, but there's a lot, it, it's heavier. So the heavier something is, it's going to raise the pitch of the drum. Yeah. Uh, and that's great if you're Tony Williams uh, or if you want, you know, bebop tones. Um, 
but a flange tube has a little more flex and a little more forgiveness. So that's the other thing about cast tubes. They're very hard on your hands, especially if you're playing professionally, you know, a hundred some odd nights a year. Yeah, like it's yeah. really hard on your hands to, if you're rim shotting on die cast sure. tubes. Flange tubes are going to allow you to tune the drums a little bit lower and there's a little bit more openness to the sound. So the die cast tube will focus the sound, raise the pitch a little bit. Flange tube is going to give you a little bit more width and a little more forgiveness to the hands. Gotcha. So, Good. Very good explanation. Yep. Uh, and so, uh, and unfortunately about this kit, there's not a lot of great pictures uh, of this set. Uh, I just, I wish there was because it's a beautiful kit. But if you watch the Rock and Rio DVD, um, you know, you can, you can see, yeah. uh, you can see it clearly. But the big change on this kit is uh, he's moved uh, to Dimension Series Pisces. So he went from the 2002s to the Dimensions, which is which are very, Dimensions was a very short-lived line that replaced the Sound Formula um, mm. line, and it was their attempt at, at getting something just positioned between 2002 and Signature. I think it was priced at where the 2002s were, but there was a little more hammering going on there, and uh, so he was moving to those because they were trying to, to really do a nice push on those. So yeah, we were using Power Crashes, uh, 16, 17, 19, Dimensions Power Crashes, a rude 18-inch crash ride, 2002 14-inch sound edge hi-hats, 13-inch 602 heavy bell, it's the same one, and the 22-inch Power Bell ride Dimensions, and a 17-inch rude crash ride. So he's got two rudes on this kit. 20-inch Dimensions medium heavy crash, 22, 24 inch 2002 crash in a 22 inch dimensions power china. He's really mixing it up here with yeah. the, the lines. D dimensions, 2002s, roots. It's, it's uh, quite a mashup, but I think it's because they didn't perhaps didn't offer all those sizes and dimensions. That he much, wanted. But, yeah. Yeah. For maybe. Sure. Yeah. He's also using a Janista snare drum on this kit. And Jan you had asked earlier if Signia was the top of the line. And that is the fact of the matter. Yes. The Janista was positioned just below it. Now, okay. the thing is, in a lot of these lines, there's no difference in quality between the Janista and the Signia. A lot of these companies will say there is and price it differently, but yeah. it, it's not. The Janista was a Finnish birch. Signia was North American maple. So your real cost there is importing the North American maple, and that's what brings the cost up a little bit but this quality no different interesting i had a janista that i got off of a uh, auction site where there's like amazon overstock yeah and you get it and you don't know if it's damaged or not but it right, was a right. janista it was a janista orange sparkle kit where yeah. it it looked like the floor tom had fallen and it cracked the yeah. the outer the, everything was fine mm -hmm. but um i got it i played it for a while and i ended up selling them because that was my plan but yeah. um Really nice drums. Yeah, that was so, that was years later than this. This that was in the two you know yeah twenty tens. But uh, love them. Great. Premier's been resurrected uh, more times than <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, but when they did resurrect them that time around, their their uh, their their people that were put in charge were said told they needed to bring back Janista, and they did, and they were maple drums. Yeah. So beautiful. what you had were maple, and they were they were made in Asia. They weren't they weren't made in the UK. But okay. Uh, if that just gives you a glimpse at how tone deaf um, they were, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Like the Janista was a birch drum set. That was so. Okay, great. You're bringing them back. Uh, you're making it overseas. Okay, I get it. But can they be birch? Like, can you use the same? It, so it's a different <laughs> drum with the same yeah, name, name yeah. basically. It doesn't make it doesn't make sense. But no. And I was always surprised that he, Nico himself liked that Janista birch snare drum. I don't know why he went there, but they it sounded great. And, and, and on that Rock and Rio DVD, I love the sound of that, that snare drum. Yeah. So I think this is where the Emperor X snare head came in, the, the Remo Emperor X, which I associate with his drum sound. Uh, I, I never cared for that head. And the minute I put one on a drum, I said, oh, my God, this sounds like Nico McBrain's <laughs> snare drum sound. Like, like I really, it, it, it sounded great. 
So, uh, yeah, this is a, a, a new thing for him. He's ambassadors on the Toms, coded ambassadors, Emperor X on the snare, fiber skin, fiber skin power stroke three on the bass drum. Okay. So we're talking a different, a different bass drum head altogether, and, but a beautiful bass drum sound. This is, I love the bass drum sound. This game. Yeah. That has muffling built in, right? Yes. On that, yeah, yeah. That's getting into that world. Okay. Yeah. So that was really uh, one of the first heads that had the single ply head with that pre-built muffle ring. And what a yeah. difference. Oh, yeah. Those heads made. I mean, yeah. crazy. Uh, so he used this kit to record the next album, the, the Dance of Death album. We saw this in the Rock and Rio video. So this is another very historic kit. This is probably my, my second Holy Grail kit uh, after the... Uh, the concert song Sonophonic uh, from Power Slave. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, very, very cool kit. And this is where we start. This is, look at this kit. This this was used for. Amazing. Yeah. yeah, this is a painted finish. Um, so this was another big change. Uh, we are back on hardware, we're back on regular stands and not a rack. Um, this is when Premiere came out with what they were calling the 6000 series hardware. Uh, and so I think they listened to Nico uh, and they, they started employing memory locks and he was very happy about that and he was able to lose the rack system. And as you can see, we've got different lugs here. So this is a different line. This is what they were calling these the Premiere series at the time because this was th – this. They were at the at the time. Premier was kind of in their death rattle. I think at that point they were mm. really in trouble, uh, or maybe they had just come back from receivership. I can't remember. Like it happened a lot, many times. It's happened a lot that brand. <laughs> yeah. um, and so this was their rebirth, their re-entry, and so they came up with this Premier series line. Um, and this particular kit, I think, is stunning. Because after the Brave New World Tour, they did a tour um, which was uh, pretty cheeky. It was called Give Me Ed Till I'm Dead. Uh, that was the name of the tour. And so <laughs> they, and Eddie, Ed being Eddie. Uh, yeah, the, and, and so. Yeah, logo or icon, their uh, mascot. Mascot, basically. yes. Yeah. Yes. So this uh, gentleman by the name of Wayne Saunders painted these drums. Um, Unbelievable. I, I think it's just, oh man, I. I isn't that amazing? Yeah, it's kind of like well, and it's the black and white goes back to that kind of one rare kit, the the, the rarely yep. seen kit there. But mm -hmm. uh, and you've seen this in person. There's a picture of you yes. next to it. Is that at Nam or something? Yes, or? yeah, yep. Look at this guy. Uh, <laughs> there I am. A half um, man. Yeah, I have. Uh, they they made a reissue of this kit with a wrap finish, or they were going to, and I actually have the wrap. For really? all of the drums, yeah. Uh, Tim O'Neill, who was working at Premiere uh, during this time, like he had an extra set of the rap, and he gave that to me. That's awesome. He knew I, yeah, and I just haven't figured out what I'm going to do with it. Like just the rap, like a roll, just the rap. I don't have the drums. Rap. I have the rap. Yeah, got it, got it. Um, but I, I just I thought this kit was so beautiful. I, I really just. Loved it. The, the yeah. artwork is, is just stunning. So, so people who are like walking the dog can can know it's it's a basically black base coat on the paint. I guess it varies here, but but then with white, almost like ink splatter looking kind of. Mm. If that's a way to describe it, like artwork of of Eddie and uh, on the front has the kind of maiden Egyptian look, but just incredible. This is he then gets for for a long time in his career gets very into custom paint and more uh wild looking drum sets. This but is this, the beginning. This, this is this is, this is the first kit where this starts to end we're, we're now entering that that phase of of uh themed artwork on the drums. Yeah. Gone are the days of our single color drums. This is really now we're going with album themes. But he's and, always been like blue like it looked like uh the the marquee the blue premieres then there was like blue peisty logos. There's yes. always been some cohesiveness yes to brave new world had a blue theme uh, yeah. virtual 11 had a red theme so the drums were red yeah but they just didn't have this ornate artwork no now we're just blowing it out yeah and i mean i just can't like how long it must have taken this guy to paint these drums this way just it, it's really 
yeah. stunning. And of the album themed kits, I, I would say, you know, this is right up there for me. I, I think this kit is just gorgeous. So we have uh, the premiere series where Maple, there were seven plies, so it was a slightly thicker shell. And the bass drum on this is the Gen X shell. Uh, they they had a short-lived line uh, during the Signia Genista era called the Gen X, which was birch maple blend. And and so that's what he loved. He loved that birch and maple blend. So hmm. they made that for his bass drum, and he was using a matching maple, maple snare on this kit. And we're using the same hats, Code Ambassadors on the Tom, Temper X on the snare, and the Fiber Skin P3. Nice. Uh, DW pedal and hi-hat stand. And he's using big first sticks. And then we're back to signatures for the most part, um, except for uh, we've got a couple of roots. We've got the uh, 17 and, and 16 crash rides on this kit. We've got signature 19 and 20 um, power crash. Uh, I have a sound creation bell ride listed here. So it's possible he went back to this ride for that tour. Although I think that may be a miss. Prints? I'm not sure. Hmm. Um, and but signature full crashes 20 and 22, and a signature 22 heavy china and a 40 inch symphonic gong. And I'm, try, I'm trying to see if I have a live picture. So here's a live picture of that kit. Yeah. And yeah, that looks like the sound creation. So he went back to that for that tour. Now, would this have been? Would there have been multiple of these kits painted for the road, like an A, B, and C kit, or was this a one of one? Or you know, I don't know the answer to that. I okay. I, I think there was more than one. Uh, I don't. I can't say definitively. Gotcha. Uh, but it's funny, uh, and and my memory is spotty now of this. But the very first night I met Nico was right around this time. It was two thousand four. And it was on the Dance of Death tour, but for some reason, I believe he was using this snare drum on that kit, and it was stolen from the gig. And and so he was he was uh, pretty upset about that. And this as, white white snare that yeah, says Iron but, Maiden. Yes, but I believe it was recovered uh, from what I've been told. Like it, they were able to recover that drum. Who the hell still steals Nico McBrain's snare in probably an arena from? Iron Maiden, like how does that? Well, even... that that's a nice segue into our next kit. <laughs> so just put a cork in that one for a moment. All right, we'll, all right. we'll talk about that. Yeah, um, later. And in in keeping with the theme of of uh, Wayne Saunders and his paint jobs, Wayne painted this kit, which is the Dance of Death kit. And if there's any crime in this world, it's that we don't have the the ornate pictures of this kit because. Many of us contest that this is the best uh, artwork theme, album theme. I, I just think it's gorgeous. Oh, it's uh, awesome. Yeah. The red, a- absolutely stunning kit. Yeah. Love it. Love yeah. that. And from from the audience perspective, seeing this design, again, to explain for people, kind of a black and white spiral design with like a kind of flares coming off of it like a sun. It's hard to explain. Yeah. But, um incredible on a red on a, a red drum set yes and they're it's just absolutely gorgeous now a lot of these kits live uh in their warehouse in england but this is one of those kits that made its way back to florida where he lives and so I, in the past few years uh somebody broke in and, and, and stole some of the drums from this kit so from some, the warehouse no no from a, a storage unit that he had Oh geez. So th- that that's why I, I you know segued into this one because Man. This, this kit is not complete. Uh, somebody has a few pieces from it, and I I'm of the belief that it's going to be recovered at some point because what are, what are you going to do with it? Yeah, you, you, it's obvious who's this. Is. Right, right. There's nothing you can do with these drums other than keep them in your your home. But it's or just rewrap cheap. it and then you ruin it and then what's the point? What, what's the point? Just thieves. Just horrible people thieves thieving yeah so that is the uh the dance of death kit and that is the same show as we know before uh is the premiere series maple toms birch maple kick and uh, maple snare gw pedal and we're using 
The same cymbal setup, the same head setup, same sticks. So it's really the same. Yeah, interesting pictures here of it set up as a five piece, which I assume are how he can play it as a complete, sort of complete kit uh, that you included in your folder yeah. that are, uh, but it is bizarre a little bit. You're not used to seeing Nico on a little five piece right. like this. Well, I, I told you about, uh, he does the uh, charity oh, concert. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at, you know, at his restaurant every year. And that's what he was, did this one, this one particular year, he brought this kit and gotcha. just a five piece kit. And each year that the, the concert gets a little bit bigger. And so the drums get a little bit. Bigger. So now he's just bringing his whole ring. <laughs> yeah, but back might then, as, might as well. just a five piece. Cool. Yeah. Um, and so that'll bring us to the next kit, uh, which uh, this one is, there's very few uh, pictures of this one. This is the uh, kind of referred to as the Ozfest kit. Because after the, uh, uh, Dance of Death uh, album uh, and tour, they went to uh, Ozfest and they did that. And so this is kind of referred to as the uh, eggshell premiere kit because if you're familiar with the incident where Iron Maiden was pelted with eggs uh, as a result of Sharon Osbourne's, uh, Sharon Osbourne was not happy with how Bruce was referring to Ozzy. Uh, so there was a little bit of a kerfluffle and so she had people pelt the band with eggs oh wow yeah come on sharon <laughs> yeah i wouldn't really want to get on her bad side uh, no no so. we love her and we have no issues with her <laughs> she will destroy us yeah so we we know this kid has the eggshell kit there's not a lot of photos uh, of this one but i will bring it up um see the best quality uh, photo i can get it's kind of a cool kit because yeah. this was uh, called the early days they were doing the early days tour uh, they were playing um, really stuff off their first few albums. And this was an attempt for them to kind of turn, uh, to, 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 to basically capture a lot of the younger crowd at OzFest. Because OzFest, you know, was a lot of the real heavy bands of the day. Yeah. But Maiden is, is, is playing just under uh, down bill from Sabbath. And so, you know, Maiden and Sabbath are your legacy bands. Yep. This is a great opportunity to expose them to the younger generation. And it was probably the most important tour they played uh, at that time, I think in terms of setting themselves up for future success, because at, at, as soon as they did this tour, after that, any concert you went to, you start seeing kids. You start seeing- Maiden t-shirts become yeah, kind of popular. Yeah. And, yeah, that's interesting. You don't yeah. think of a band like Maiden having to do that, but- Well, they would have done well. They would have done well. They would have done well, but the, they, they were ta- they wanted to build future from future business, yeah, and, and and seek those opportunities. And and so, it doesn't matter what kind of music you like. If you go see Iron Maiden live, if you're not a fan, you're probably going to walk away a fan. Because You'll be their impressed. live show is just fantastic. Yeah. And so for younger c- uh, kids that are you know seeing all these super heavy bands, they're seeing Maiden and they're going, wait a second, I think this is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very good exposure for them, and and, uh, and not yeah. a lot of exposure for this kit. We do not know a lot about the the parents of this kit. Uh, but is it like is, a, it looks like a steel kind of like diamond plate kind of finish, or are those? I mean, from yeah. a distance, it, or are they like it almost looks like little swords or something? But I guess no, they're like metal. Yeah, to look like steel, old and rusty is what they're they're calling it, or what he called it. Um, yeah. And this is, this is what uh, the premiere was calling the Elite Series at the time. So it was basically the same as the premiere Series. I know that their suspension mount that they were making was a little bit different at the time. Uh, but I don't think he was even using the suspension mount because he's never really been an advocate for them. Yeah. Uh, other than what we know on the Signius. Uh, it, it looks different from the front view then you go to the higher res vi- yeah. uh, picture from the back of the view. They look like different uh, colors almost. Yeah, I don't know a lot about this kit. Again, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah, it's just it's you know one of those. It was a shorter tour, um, but it's it's this is cool. what we have. And yeah, it's yeah, a rack it. finish. This is not a paint. Okay. So I think there was a company that were called Greenshire Wraps that did the wraps for these drums. 
And the sizes, again, are all the same. Uh, five and a half inch maple snare drum. And uh, I've still got the same cymbal setup as what we're seeing on the other kits. Although that ride cymbal on this kit, it looks like we're seeing the very first power slave ride cymbal as we know it, which is the signature reflector bell ride. And I cannot remember exactly if that's, if it was out yet or if that's a prototype, but um, it's a fantastic ride cymbal and it's it uses that to this day. Nice. So that is uh, that kit. And now we'll move on to our next set, which is the camo kit. Now this set is the a matter of life and death theme. Um, and that was a real war themed album. And so for that was an album they were incredibly proud of so much that when they decided to tour it, they said, we're just going to play our whole album. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and works. this is what I love about that band because, you know, there's so many fans who are just angry. They're like, they wanted the hits, but they love this album so much. They wanted to play the whole thing. Yeah. And I, I was thrilled with it because I really wanted to hear uh, those tunes. And so it was a great album. One of their best sounding albums. One of the reasons it's one of their best sounding albums is because we are seeing the return of the LM402 snare drum. Mm. Uh, the LM402 snare drum, the Ludwig, this is the same drum that he bought in 1975 and he used on the first few albums. Uh, well, on the first, most all the 80s, he used that drum. He brought that back for this album. And man, that drum just got better with age. It is the identical. It is the one. It is oh, that, yeah. that it's snare that drum. that exact drum. Yeah, okay. that wow. exact cool. drum. Cool. And I still, that, that's my best selling snare drum. I've sold more LM402s than anything. I mean, hundreds of them. Yeah. Uh, and it just sounds like I identify that sound with Nico, with Bonham, you know, with, with Alex Van Halen. Uh, but it just, there's something right in the world when Nico's playing an LM402. Uh, it's, yeah. Yeah. And this, though, like this kit. Beyond the drums, the kind of camo look, now we've got, I mean, his drums are basically in a set that looks like he's in a bunker with like yeah. sandbags, Yep, kind of World War II, World War I kind of thing. It's, it's unbelievable. Very war themed. Yeah. Very much war themed. And you can see the little stuffed animals even got, <laughs> as, as Sooty's got his, his helmet on, Yep, uh, which is a. Uh, Pretty cute there. Yeah, yeah. Sizes of this kit are also uh, the same. Um, and we've got the signatures and the roots. Um, so this kit, uh, we're seeing it looks like the same exact setup as we saw on the last kit. Uh, obviously the same sticks. And what we're kind of questioning on this particular kit is, is he on DW9000 yet? And it is unclear mm. if he's using the 9000 pedal yeah we don't we don't know the answer to that one yeah there's kind of a side view picture that's like um in one of there that one that's like that's a 5000 that's a 5000 yeah, that is a 5000 but maybe you know later maybe he switched who knows but yeah is this a wrap or? yeah this is a greenshire wrap okay uh, one so we're a really cool looking kit. It matched the theme of the album, but in the grand scheme of things, not as memorable as, as some of the other ones. Yeah. Uh, appearance wise. Sure. And then that's going to bring us to uh, the next kit, which is the somewhere back in time blue kit. This so is iconic. These are people know this one. This one comes from like, if you watch the flight six, six DVD, which is also if, if you're a new maiden, if you're, if you want to get interest and in see, like, if you want to get familiar with the band, watch Rock and Rio or the Flight 66 DVD yeah. and watch the movie uh, that comes along with it because this is the kit that you're going to see in there. And it's a great sounding kit. Probably the one that people have seen the most of. Yeah. Maybe it's on social media as well and yeah. promoted. I mean, it's kind of, a, again, to explain, it's for people, it's like a turquoise, kind of an Aztec finish to it with Eddie on the side. Um, pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool. It is. I, I, I catching. Yes. Yeah. Here's a picture of it set up at, at his shop. Yeah. And so, you know, I've not studied this set to really 
try to understand the theme of it so much. Uh, but it, I, I think probably because I was never as drawn to this kit as the other ones, but you know, again, this is, a, this is one that a lot of people know and love, but yeah. Uh, shell wise, it's the same. It's the, the maple, the maple toms, the birch maple kick, uh, LM402 live, uh, LM402 snare drum. There are notes that the sycamore snare that came in around this time, it's not, we're not clear though. We're not sure if it was on this tour. I think it may have been later. I may be wrong there, but hmm. I think he used the LM402 out throughout this, this tour. Uh, same heads. We've got the coded ambassadors uh, on the top, ebony ambassadors on the bottom, Emperor Rex on the snare drum, fiber skin P3 on the kick. He used this kit to record uh, Book of Souls album as well. That's that's a key thing to note. Does it? Um, it appears in one of these in your first picture in this album that that the one I'm looking at. There's like a little bell hanging above the gong which is interesting are you seeing that in the ship's bell yes yeah, yeah. that's pretty cool is yeah that, has that always been there or? No, so you know it's listed in his gear listing early in the 80s uh but there's sometimes i see pictures and i don't notice it there yeah but we do see it here so yeah um yeah there it is it's right there so and we're, this is where we're moving to signature heavy foals on the Peisty front. So um, he, he's gone to uh, mostly those, and he's still got his Root Crash Ride 17, but the setup as I see it here is a 15, a uh, 16, uh, and 19 heavy foals, 20 heavy foal, 18 heavy foal, signature 14-inch heavy hi-hat. Still has a 602 bell. He's got his power slaves, reflector bell ride, and a t prototype signature 20 inch crash, which is uh, probably a different thickness. I'm guessing it was that fast and medium, um, which is a slightly heavier, fa heavier fast. Hmm. 22 inch signature heavy china and the symphonic gong. My notes also say 9,000 pedal and hi hat stand. Okay. Uh, and this was the kit that he, he said he used for Book of Souls, which I believe I mentioned. And what, what year are we at right now? This would have been 2008 Okay. Ish. Yeah. So the 9,000 was relatively new at that point. Yes. Right? Okay. Yeah. I remember when that came out being like, this is unbelievable, but I can't afford it right now. Yeah, that was a big <laughs> deal. When that pedal came out, that yeah. was a big deal. Yeah. And it they're still awesome. is. It's oh, they're incredible. still just a very popular, very popular yeah. kit. Yep. And so that's going to bring us to, there are no pictures. This is the Made in England tour. This is, we're talking 2012. Now, if we go back to that Gimme Ed kit with the black and white, there's all kinds of pictures. That's because it was brought to NAM later on. But in 2012, social media was not what it is now. And no. in 2012, they did this, this tour. And man, I don't know if I ever saw any pictures of this kit. Uh, like I, I saw them live. I saw them on this tour. I couldn't remember what the kit looked like. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, there is so few pictures of this kit and this is gorgeous kit. Yeah. How would you describe it? Kind of an ice theme? Like, yeah, blue. it's blue. So this is the made, the made in England tour. They uh, were kind of revisiting the 1988 uh, period of seven sun. Yeah. And that had a very, Arctic bluish whitish theme and and so his original kit was white well this one is blue um, also Greenshire wraps it was a wrap kit um, just gorgeous kit and this the, the pictures that I'm showing you are the only pictures that I could find of this kit wow and what's interesting to note is if we look at this picture that I have right up here yeah he is using what I believe is the prototype Sycamore snare. It's got Signia hardware on it, uh, but it is a five and a half shell. It's different color. I believe this is a Sycamore drum. That so I, I'm I'm willing to bet that these were made by Keith Keogh. Uh, when Keith when, when Keith Keogh, as we know him now, uh, is um, British drum company, 
Uh, oh yeah. Okay. Which but, we'll, we'll remember that name. You right. Know, it'll- <laughs> right. Uh, but Keith had a custom company called KD drums and he was making, uh, Keith goes back, going back a little further. He was working with a guy and I can't remember his name, the guy who was, uh, invented the premier resonator shell. And if you're not, do you remember the, the, the resonator shell for those of you who don't know was basically a shell lining that covered all the hardware on the inside of the shell. So if you looked inside the drum that you could, it was no hardware. And the, the, the theory was that the drum was going to resonate more this way. If you didn't like the way that worked, you could actually pop the liner out of the shell and have it that way too. Yeah. Uh, very cool, uh, invention. Premier bought that technology from that guy, uh, and used them to make their high end drums for a number of years. Well, Keith was working for that person for a number of years. I think that's how he got started. Hmm. Then started his KD drums. And then when Premier uh, was going through another, you know, death rattle period when they needed to revive themselves, they I think they'd lost their staffing maybe. Uh, and they just bought Keith's KD drum company. And they acquired that company and Keith became uh, an employee of Premier. Interesting. And so Keith, brought, I knew there was a connection to yes. Premier, but I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. Keith brought all of his fire and energy to Premier, uh, which didn't last long. Uh, but there was some very cool things that that he did with them, and one of them being the Sycamore snare drum. Hmm, and nice. that was something he did for Nico, and I know Nico loved that drum because you can see him using it in that picture, but in this picture, he's got the LM402. So this is where we're starting to see the LM402 drift off into the sunset and the Sycamore is taking its place. Yeah. So going down to Florida to retire. Like yeah. Many, uh- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. 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 Well put. So just in, in look at Sooty, he's got a, a parka on. Uh, that's that's so nice, funny. Yeah. Wow. Um, and we don't see the ship's bell either uh, on this kit. Yep. So uh, if I had to, uh, not mentioned already, same shells, maple toms, birch maple kick, uh, same tom sizes, same remos. He's got predominantly signatures. And we've got, of course, his root as we know it. And the other note that I have on this one is that we're, we're, the, the, the snare drum, that sycamore snare drum is likely what he used on Book of Souls uh, to record that album, that, that snare drum. Um, He couldn't remember entirely, but he thinks that it's likely. Now, it's also more likely that this would be the kit to record Book of Souls, but my notes say that it was actually the Somewhere Back in Time kit, the the previous kit. Okay. So that one we're really kind of not clear on, but that's what my notes say. Sure. Um, And in fairness, like, you know, I'm sure there's people out there, there out there that are like, "Whoa, I can't believe you can't remember that." Listen, like when you're when you're touring and, and recording for over 50 years, yeah, you A can't remember every detail. Like if no. you ask me, and I do get asked now and again, "What snare drum I use on this particular record?" and I'm like, I, I, I'll listen to it and I'll be like, "I think it's this." <laughs> but I don't yeah, remember. Probably this. Yeah. That's interesting. I do remember the sandwiches that people brought in <laughs> the day that we recorded that, but I can't remember which snare. The drum. snare. Yeah. yeah. No, because they just always... put too many onions on that turkey sandwich. It's, yeah. They... Burping the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> so this is um, the end of. Uh, uh, actually, no, we're actually going to the next kit, the Final Frontier kit. Uh, So it's the final frontier in a a couple of different ways here. So he probably used this last kit for, to record final frontier. Uh, But uh, because final, final frontier is before book of souls. Um, But again, we're not a hundred percent clear on that. And now we've got a nice picture of the final frontier kit, which is nice because now we're entering that social media era. There's a little bit, bit more, and this is from a premier catalog. Beautiful. And, and the Final Frontier is kind of a space theme. Yeah. Uh, and and so that's that's what we have uh, for the graphics on this kit. Um, and, and it looks very similar to the, the prior kit. You know, it's a, it's a greenish, blackish theme, but there's some blues in there as well. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, very neat. I mean, these are cool, kind of the whole astrological looking thing. I mean, maybe from the from the audience, this one might not be the most like like compared to like the entire thing being military themed, and right? Like bunker, you might not notice it as much, but up yeah. close, this is just beautiful. Yeah, it is. It's, it is a good looking kit. It's a great sounding kit. Yeah. Um, and he is using, uh, my notes on this say that he's on the Sycamore kit at this point and he's still using the, um, he, he's still using the, uh, signatures as we know it, those symbols, DW 9000, same Remo heads, the shells have the same seven ply maple, birch maple bass drum. Hmm. So nothing's really changed there. So this is like, that was a period of very static, uh, you know, symbol and, and, and he knew what he was, he was liking at that point and yeah. didn't deviate much other than say snare drums. Sure. But it was also at this point where premier said, we're not going to make drums in England. Move to Taiwan or something yeah. like that. Yeah. They, they, they figured that it was just a, a better move for the brand to uh, import all of their drums from the far East instead of manufacturing in the UK. And so that was, uh, you know, there's, the, there's, the drums made in Taiwan and China these days are great. I've heard that many times. Yeah, yeah there's, I think the 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 connotation of being oh it's their crap is just kind of shaken off a bit. Oh yeah, because yeah. I think they're yeah it, they're everything's nice. Yeah, the, the the stuff that's coming out of the Far East is very very good yeah. uh, these days. But he didn't identify with that. He wanted British built drums uh, because there is this thing called romance that you enjoy with. The drum manufacturing and it's just you know uh it's a british brand but it wasn't built there he, he wanted to make he wanted to play british built drums yep. only live once right yep so that was the end of that relationship uh with premiere and so that was also the end of that relationship uh premiere for keith keo as well and keith had presented a, a design and presented a business plan to premiere um of how uh he felt that they could move forward making drums and they rejected it. So he used that business plan to start the British drum company. Now you would think, why doesn't Nico just go over to British drum company? Well, they are not even a company yet. <laughs> they yeah. just, they're just getting started. And so he is uh, in one of the top touring bands in the world. He needs to have the full support of drum company. So he, his first inclination is to call Carl Heinz, who's now back at Sonar and rekindle that relationship and that's exactly what happened and that was the most exciting uh part of nam i think that year for in us classic uh, iron maiden fans we were all thrilled to have uh nico back in the fold with sonar drums it was really exciting yeah what a big deal this kit was gold hardware love it yeah we're, cool. this is we're seeing the timing was just right on this one because this is when social media is really starting to pop. Uh, and, and, and there are tons of pictures of this kid. The gold hardware, I mean, people just went nuts uh, over this one. Yeah. And I mean, if you look at this picture, look at his DW9000 pedal. Yeah. That's Even that's gold-plated. Yeah, that's the base cool. of his throne is gold-plated. Uh, the cowbell is gold plated. Oh my God. The bottom of the front heads appear to be <laughs> gold. mirror finished. Yeah. Starfire. Gold. Those are Remo's Starfire. Okay. okay yeah. Yeah. So that, that is uh, a pretty penny to get that all done. I mean, yeah. The microphones. Yes. Yeah. Gold. And if you notice the counterweights, um, let's see if I can find a close up of the, those counterweights we have not seen. Oh, who's that guy? Look at this. <laughs> hey, look at you. That's Was me that... at Madison Square Garden. Wow. Yeah, at Madison Square Garden, minutes before they went on stage. Oh, my gosh. That's pretty cool. Uh, and very special thanks to Kelly Peisty from Peisty Simples. She she was at the show with us, and she brought me right back. back and and Charlie, uh, Nico's drum tech, uh, was so kind to let me get up there and, and take this quick picture. Uh I don't. I barely even remember that moment because I was like not even. Yeah, uh, you're floating. I, I'm floating. I was just like, "This is so awesome!" Because you can hear the crowd. And, oh my god! Yeah, there I met the kid. A very cool moment. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, the ca counterweights are yeah. those gold? 
yeah, those those have been gone for a while, right? Yeah, if those were something that was available in the eighties, I'm just trying to find the best picture. I, I think that's going to be the best picture uh, of them. Mm-hmm. This was something that they offered in the eighties. I don't know where he got these because in the eighties they were black, and then the Sonar logo was white. So they may have been made specifically for these stands, mm. but somebody must have made them for them. Uh, perhaps it was the company that made the counterweights in the first place. I really don't know the answer to that one. They look cool. Mm-hmm. Another way to advertise for the brand. Yeah, it is. It isn't it? I mean, that is just a brilliant way to fly a logo for, yeah. for a brand. Yeah. Now, there are questions about this kit that I have and some people have that, that we're not really sure because what's kind of cool is if you look at the bass drum, you can see he's using the T rods. Now on the SQ2s, they use the round knobs. Uh, he's using T rods, and it looks like they're the T rods from the '80s era. So I'm not sure if they dug those out for this particular kit or or how that worked. Uh, and I'm also not sure if it's a metal bass drum hoop or is it if it's a gold wrap over the bass drum hoop. Sure. So yeah. if I sort of zoom in here, it, it's tough to it's tough to say because I was wondering if this was like a ferromanganese bass drum hoop like we saw on the old phonics, but that is a question that we just we do not know the answer to. Yeah, very detail oriented. Oh, I feel like there's yeah. so many little details. Yeah, I wonder how much time went into the planning of this one. Like, because like, you know, you can't just get all of this stuff, like the counterweights, the gold <laughs> plating. Yeah. It doesn't just happen overnight. No. And interestingly, I saw them uh, a few nights, I saw it like this tour, I think four or five nights. And there were times uh, he was using mics. And then I think later in the tour, they went to, um, the May system, the inner mics on the toms. Oh, wow. Cool. Internal mics, yeah. And they sounded great, too. This kit sounded on this tour sounded absolutely great. Hmm. Uh, and this Love is the, the kit he used on the, the latest album, Senjutsu. Cool. Uh, and so, really, this is the, you know, like I said, full respect to Premiere. I think I love, this, I love the sound of those drums. But when you hear the first track on Senjutsu, the latest album, it's like, hello. You know, <laughs> sonars yeah. are back. It is yeah. just the cut and the bite of those toms. It's unbelievable. Uh, yeah. So it's just, it, it settles the argument for me. The sonars are just it. But that raises the question of, uh, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves here. Cause mm-hmm. I mean, I, well, let's do talk. Are symbols the same? Signature reflectors. Yeah. Heavy fulls. Uh, and he's using heavy full hi hats uh, this time around. Yeah, uh, and he's using a signature fast medium twenty inch. So that leads me to believe the twenty inch prototype we spoke of earlier was a, fa- a fast medium. So the heads, uh, coated ambassadors, Emperor Rex, fiber skin, fiber skin power stroke. That's all the same. Sycamore snare drum on this kit, fourteen by uh, five and a half is listed, and okay. not not five. Twenty four by eighteen inch bass drum. And the shells are medium beach on this kit. So he's back to the beach uh, and. That's the, the sound as, as we know. Yeah, yeah. But that after, after that kit, uh, we go to the uh, Legacy of the Beast kit. Um, now, there's people out there that love that Book of Souls kit. They went nuts over the gold hardware and all bananas over everything. I'm not a gold hardware guy. This is the kit I love. I, I think this is... This. I would choose black over gold. Yeah. But again, you can't, I mean, there's certain yeah. gold kits that look phenomenal as well. Everyone, that's the fun thing is everyone can do whatever yeah. they want, but black is cool. For the most part, I don't care for um, black hardware, but on this drum kit, I love it. I think it yeah. just, I think it looks amazing. Yeah. Uh, and, and we're, we're, this is the uh, Legacy of the Beast tour, which is, Again, like that black and white set, this is uh, the black and white set the, the, that we looked at earlier. This kit has the different eddies from all of the periods. Uh, and look at the bass drum head on that. The front bass, isn't that gorgeous? Yeah. 
awesome. Absolutely stunning kid. Yeah. Uh, just absolutely stunning. Uh, yeah. Kind of a st- for everyone again, so they know it's kind of a stained glass. Yes. Look to this with all the eddies. Yes. John Douglas did a beautiful gong for this kid. There oh, were really? a few gongs, black and red, but he did a, a beautiful um, cathedral gong that is, it, it's unbelievable. And Man. the start of that show, I think it was a red gong. And then when Revelations happens, like they were putting a scrim in front of his kit, which was like, why, why are they doing that? Because they opened with Ace's eye, they opened with uh, then uh, Where Eagles Dare. But when Revelations came on, like they pulled the scrim away, they re-railed this beautiful gong, it was just, yeah, this That's kid. Awesome. The gong reveal. Yeah, it was a big, big deal. Cool. Um, and unfortunately, uh, this is really the, the, the last sonar kit. Um, so we've got the same symbols. Obviously, they're black. We've got the John Douglas gong. Um, and, you know, basically there was personnel changeover at sonar. Uh, there was a couple other things at play. Uh, that I'm not really um, totally privy to, and yeah. uh, you know, but things were you know not good. Um, and at the same time, he started a practice pad with British Drum Company called the Boomer Pad. So that was British Drum Company's way of getting their foot in the door. And I think that he always wanted to be. He, he would really wanted to be with British Drum Company. They just needed to be ready for him. Yeah. And then the minute they were ready for him. He went over. Uh, Man. And again, it wasn't uh, any disrespect to Sonar. It had nothing to do with the sound of drums. He let I me mean, still love Sonar drums. Yeah. Uh, but but it's British drum. Yeah. Drum, yeah. And he's Nico and yeah. he wants to play British. It doesn't get much more good, good choice on the name because right. it's as British as right. it gets. And, and so that was, so that, that was kind of a quick thing. Like it's it, so the, the first thing they did was they made a kit that looked just like this one. They did two kits. They made one that looked just like the Sonar kit. Which he could probably just get the file from the design. And yes. Just, they print the same That's wrap it. and just cover it and so use the same bass drum design. And, or you head, can see that say. here. Yeah. Which is, I mean, it's gorgeous. And I don't know of a, of a close-up of where the wrap seam meets. Like, they had a really cool way of, of joining that seam. Oh, cool. Uh, but the big announcement uh that they had that nico was coming over happened in november of that year and i remember i got a, a, a an email from mel uh who used to work there and he said hey i don't know what you're doing in november but would you want to come over for an event i really can't say much about it and i'm like oh, mel i live in america it, like what yeah. are you talking about i had no idea like yeah. he could he had to be very quiet about it yeah um but that was their big announcement that, that Nico was coming over. But I talked to Mel a few times about doing a British Drum Co. episode, but he's no longer with the company. Right. Right. right okay. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, he nice probably guy. still do it though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he, he, yeah. He's a, Mel's a great guy. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, see, he, he had to move on to something else, and but sure. still they get along uh, wonderfully. Yep. Uh, so this kit <clears throat> is essentially the same as that SQ2 kit in terms of. Uh, you know, sizes and the symbols used. But at this point, we're moving over to the le- the legend British company, British company legend shells, which is birch. Uh, and the size is actually has a six by seven inch tom, slightly deeper. Um, but everything else is, is really the same. Hmm. But they, and they made that kit as sort of a knee jerk reaction, uh, not a major reaction, but they, they needed to get him in a kit right away. They used that. Of course. Yeah. And then there was, this kit was built, um, which was part two of the legacy of the beast. Uh, and this rap, I, I love the, the rap on this kit. I, I think this kit is gorgeous. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah. We've got a nice, uh, just good look at, at the albums. The, the, I believe this is also Greenshire raps, but notice the counterweight in this embassy, the counterweight on the boom stand. Um, yeah. And you can actually see it on this picture too. Like the, the counterweights are very cool. They even say "Legacy of the Beast" oh, that's on cool. on there. Yeah, yeah, kind of a thinner, more modern counterweight yeah. than the old big honkin' square things that would hang off the back. Yeah, more of a uh, sleek design. <laughs> yes, 
So something else to notice is that if you look at this picture, you'll see how the, the Legacy of the Beast logo is pointed out perfectly on every stand. Yeah. So last December, when I went down and I went to help set everything up, I'm not as detail-oriented. I set drums up, I play them, that's what I do. Yeah. Well, I set up the stands and, and I didn't do that detail and he came up and uh, he gave me a clobbering uh, over that one. <laughs> Yeah, that's <laughs> no, like, like who did this? And I was like, yeah, it was me. I mean, that's like the like when you there's an electrician and they're supposed to leave and have every uh, screw facing up in it. Like if you get your kitchen something wired, there's those little details uh, right. of like it's all supposed to be this way. Yeah, but I if I do something, I don't pay attention to it. Like right, that, right, right, right. But it pays off, and it because it it's a very cohesive look. That's right. That's right. So yeah. it, it's my fault. And uh, again, I'm sorry. <laughs> You'll never forget it. Yeah, I will never. I'll never let that one down. That's yeah, but sure. like a, a kind of a samurai look to this, which is very cool. Yeah. So again, it, it's the the legacy of the beast theme, but they did yeah. play a couple of sen- songs from Senjutsu. And so you can see uh, on that second rack tom uh, on the bass drum, we've got the Senjutsu Eddie. Yeah. As yeah, long yeah, as yeah. all the other. Uh, and this is a picture I took of this kit. Um, uh, and, and as you can see, this was after my scolding of the Legacy <laughs> of the Beast logo on the, the counter lights. Yes. Yeah. But the, yep. here's some close up pictures. And we're mo- this is where he's moved to Code Drumhead. So, uh, Code is a UK based drumhead company. Um, and he moved uh, from Remo here. He said he's, he's left Remo four times <laughs> in his career. <laughs> They just keep pulling them back. Yeah, and, and and so uh, every time he's gone back, they, they've been welcomed in with open arms because he's a gentleman about things, you know. And, yeah. And uh, he loves Remo, loves the people there, loves the heads. But again, this was sort of a, a, a British thing and, and wanted yeah. to, to use these heads. And actually I've never them. heard of them. I've they're never a very heard of new them. company. Code. Okay, yeah, cool. Well, that's great. They're a very new company. And they yeah. just actually got distribu- distribution in the United States. Uh, I'm going to be bringing them on, but it's like they haven't been available yet. This will be got it. You know, that explains why a brand new thing. And, and so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it, it, I played them. They sounded really good. Um, I was so excited just to play this kit. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my god, I'm sure. Gorgeous kit. Um, and so we have the symbols listing is the same uh, as the previous, and the sizes are also the same. All birch, um, mm. great drums. Yeah. Um, and so that kind of uh, brings us to the future past kit. And that is this one, which is what he's touring with presently, uh, which this is. I mean, look at this thing. I have not oh. seen this kit in person yet. I'm actually yeah. going to see it in a month. Uh, but this is all copper plated hardware. That, that Keith cool did himself. Looking. Keith did wow. all that. Yeah. Wow. He showed me uh, the stance a year and a half ago, I think, maybe even longer than that. Well, you know, like what he was working on. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's absolutely gorgeous. I don't think I've ever seen, maybe I have, but like a copper hardware. Sonar did it in the 80s they, with a high did. Yeah. And, oh, okay, okay. You don't see it very often at all. Though. Well, a chrome the the so uh, when you chrome plate, you use nickel, uh, nickel and, and copper, and then chrome. And so with what the, the when Sonar did, with their, they just skipped the chrome plating hardware part. Okay, or okay. maybe they did that and then put the copper on top. Not a metal just but yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah, I yeah. think was different. I think he the, the thing with the Sonar one, they don't age well. You know, you put yeah, a like a penny. Prince, yeah, it, it turns it, blue or blue, like the, the, the whole thing with the Olympic gold medal, the Olympic medals that yes. are deteriorating. And then, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so I think Keith did a much different treatment on these stands. Again, these aren't for public consumption. So people aren't going to buy these stands. But I think he did like a fire heat treatment um, after the chrome plating. Okay. To give it a bit of a scorched look. Um you know, I don't know how they'll age. I don't know how they'll hold up, but I, I think they look absolutely gorgeous and very well, fitting for this album theme. It's not like he's not going to have another drum set after this. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah. We've got whatever, 20 drum sets or, or yeah. whatever. And it's like, 
this is cool, man. These it, are cool. It is. It, it is because it's definitely a conversation piece. It's very different yeah. than the other two kits that he's had. And I think it looks great. And it's just a great advertisement for British drum. And I'm sure it sounds great. I haven't watched any bootlegs. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't even know what the set list is. I just want to be surprised. <laughs> yeah. uh, but the, uh, the kit looks great. And I'm looking forward to hearing it. It's Bert Shell's, like, uh, uh, that we know, uh, the Legend series is. Symbols are also the same, and uh, hardware is all the same. Big first sticks were still there. On this, this last kit is when we start seeing the Icarus and Talisman snare drum. Uh, and that is our, his signature series snare drums. I'm not 100% positive, but this looks like the, uh, the steel drum, which is the Talisman. Um, and, cool. and he had four. That's what he was using on, on this kit as well. Gotcha. Uh, it's so hard, you know, because I'm trying to move through these as quickly as I can. Like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Skip no. over some small details. No, and I'm, I'm very impressed. We actually got through a ton of these kits in a relatively short yeah. amount of time. Yeah. But I do want to mention that I've never played a British drum co kit. Yeah. I guess geographically, it's, I don't think, you know, you don't usually go to your drum shop very often and see them, but right. I think it's extremely cool that a new company, new ish at this point, mm -hmm. company came out and just killed it. I mean, yeah. obviously his background with working with uh, Premier and stuff, mm -hmm. but I just think that's great because it's kind of like, it's yeah. kind of like if a, you don't see like, like with car manufacturers, uh -huh. new new brands don't come out. With drums, new <sighs> brands don't really come out that often. And I think it's great that they did it, killed it. Nico is their endorsee, yeah, and they're still doing great. Yeah, you know, it's nice to see fresh, new. Um, yep. So so good good for them. You it's know? really hard to build a brand, um, yeah. and you have to do something that's kind of special. And I think they they sound great. I'm really excited agree. to see what they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, unbelievable. And and that kind of lead as we're wrapping up and getting close to the end here. Uh, it's worth mentioning uh, on that note. First off, check out British Drum Co. wherever you can online. Yeah. If it's you know if that has to be the case, or if you're near a shop and you can actually play them, go do it. But um, Maiden is going to be. They are on tour right now. Yep. I believe currently they as of right now they're in japan japan yeah it appears but this will be out later in october of 2024 they are touring the united states yeah. um so where are you gonna where are you seeing them uh i think i'm gonna i'm going up to quebec city in montreal and oh cool uh i think i'll be and i'll be at the worcester show as well and possibly new york nice um, that, that remains to be seen but uh yeah awesome that's that's a good that's a good run for me i've never seen them in quebec city so uh i've seen them in montreal and, and the canadian crowds are just the best uh, they're, awesome. yeah they're so great so uh, yeah I, i'm really excited to, uh, to see them and i'm excited to see this kit as well oh um, god yeah and, and hopefully i said enough right things so uh if i'm lucky enough to run into them i don't get a bollocking over it <laughs> <laughs> no i think that uh i hope everyone agrees with me that this is yeah. like you know uh, from from the comments on the first one people are ecstatic to see this kind of a yeah uh a, a database i guess you could mm -hmm. say of like of of nico information and again the comments of people adding little bits yes of stories of right. again that that new zealand kit was borrowed from a fan right. if that's true that's amazing i love hearing those little bits of information yeah. but um you know as as we said in the first one um at the beginning drum center of portsmouth i mean so you are the largest drum store in the world yeah, that wasn't deliberate. Um, it, it wasn't, you know, my first shop was 800 square feet. And it was just me, and I started it with nothing. And, you yeah. know, I was the only employee for about 10 months or so. And we just kept growing and growing and growing. And, and you know, whatever money came in, I just threw it back into the business. And, and so we just kept building and building. And then I kept running out of space, whatever I kept moving. And this building that we're in became available. And my banker said, you know, you should buy this building. And that's what we did. And it's 20,000 square feet. It's two old barns. Wow. It's just full of drones and merchandise. And we also have another 6,000 square foot warehouse that we ship out of. So, you know, do we do the most sales of drums? Uh, probably, no, I don't think so. But we have we are the largest square footage drum there store in the world. So, yeah, we have people from all over the world come to see us. And, uh, yeah, it's just uh, it's been one, one heck of a ride.
Yeah, yeah. Well, just as you said with Nico and you look at Maiden as an influence on a business front, I think I and many people can look at you as like, yeah, you can be professional. Yeah, we're drummers. We yeah. mess around. We we love, you know, it's music. But no, you need to make money at it and yeah. support yourself and your family. And to do it uh, requires hard work and yes. um, not just... It's just not, nothing comes easy. You got to work hard and yes. pay attention to your numbers, and um, yeah, it's inspirational. So. Hard work and enthusiasm. Yeah, because you know, I'm not that bright and I'm not that educated, but I, <laughs> I work hard. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you know that's the, that's the the key. I have found that where people will be like, "I want to start a podcast. I want to start YouTube," and it's like, I mean, there's nights where I'd want to go do something else, or yeah. I want to just sit there and watch TV. But no, I have to edit. Yep. Part two of the gear of Nico McBrain. Yeah. <laughs> and I get it done for next week. I don't yeah. think people realize what amount of work that you put into this is. And, you know, what is the ROI for you? Uh, it, it, it's not as, as you know, uh, fruitful as some might think it is. I mean, this is a tremendous lot, amount of work for you. And again, I can't thank you enough for what you're oh, yeah. doing for our community. Because oh, yeah. it's, we like, th we didn't have this and now we have it. And, uh, you know, uh, I saw Andy Zildjian uh, the other day at the shop, and, and and my wife was like, "Oh, you, my wife listens to the podcast that, that oh, you did cool. with Andy." Yeah, and he's like, "Did I sound stupid?" And like, yeah, that's the kind of answer that I would give too. He was people. great. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know, right? He, he was amazing. Yeah. yeah, talk about a down to earth guy. Oh yeah. yeah who yeah. Uh, I saw him at um, Pasic the last basic. And I was like, we got to get you back on. And I think sometimes people don't realize as I'm sure you've run into with your shop is like, Oh, you're still doing it. Yeah, I mean, not, right. not at this point, your shop right. is obviously very well established, but like early on, it's like, yeah, still doing it, still yeah. going, still yeah. getting bigger and stronger. And, um, uh, I think that's a testament to, to this. You just got to keep going. Yeah. Um, so yeah, well, Shane, I, uh, well, first off, I hope everyone listening has enjoyed this. Yeah. If you, enjoyed this and you're watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe because Shane and I were talking before about, I mean, your YouTube channel as well. Go yes. subscribe to, to the Dr Drum Center of Portsmouth as well because yeah. incredible. You've got a huge subscribership on there, but yeah. most people watch and don't subscribe, but it truly yes. does help our channels. Yeah. It helps get more views. People don't understand that. Like, like it, when you click subscribe, it, it will feed, uh, the podcast or our videos to other viewers. Yeah. So it gives us credibility. And when that happens, it gives us more visibility, which helps subsidize the expense of doing this because yeah. the videos are, they're not for us. It's a loss leader, but we lose money on them, but yeah. getting a little bit of revenue helps offset that cost. Yes. And, and I'm saying for you, you know, I don't know your exact numbers, but uh, you know, please subscribe to Bart's uh, to this podcast and, if you're subscribing, please subscribe to mine too. Yes, exa exactly. Help justify what we do to our wives. Yes. By having some money come in <laughs> and make this worthwhile. I think um, it's also worth mentioning though, Bart, before we, we part ways here is that there are a few other kits that, that but they weren't used in Iron Maiden. And so okay. we're not, we're going to just leave those out for the, the, the interest of time. Yes. Uh, people can do their own homework on yeah. those. Um, Thank you to Nico for, I mean, it's pretty yes. amazing to hear that he listened to part one. Um, yeah. Pretty incredible. Uh, I would say as well, thank you to everyone for tuning in and listening. And I would like to have, you know, open invite. Maybe we give it a couple months. But Shane, I'd love to have you back on to do uh, the sonar history because I know yeah. you mentioned that, you know, you would like to tackle that. But yeah. I, I ran into some issues of with the company and we're so far apart and we couldn't connect. Yes. And I just, it, it, it's something similar with Trixon drums. Where with Trixon, it was like, or Trixon, however you yeah. say it, it was like no one wanted to tackle it because I believe Ingo, who's in Germany, wanted to do it, but his English wasn't strong enough. And uh, it's like no one else wanted to tackle it. And it's like someone's got to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. anyway, with Sonar, I'd love to have you back on no, and do that. Do and I think it. people would enjoy that. So. Absolutely. Well, on that note, check out drumcenternh.com. I'll put your YouTube channel, your Facebook, Instagram, everything in the description. Yeah. Um, so, Shane, thank you so much for your time you. and doing this series with me, my friend. Thank, thank you. you.